Good morning, church family, and welcome. Will you stand with me as we sing together, Count Your Blessings? <laughs> out with the chorus first and then goes into the verses.
Thank you for being here today. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll continue. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you make us a family of God. And Father, I pray that as we continue in this worship service, Father, you'd be in our midst, that your Holy Spirit would empower us just to give you the praise and the honor that you're so richly due. Father, thank you again for loving us and for the mercy that you show us in Jesus. In his name we pray, and amen. You can remain seated on this song, and we'll stand for the, the last one. So we're going to sing. <laughs>
just a closer walk with thee. copy of the Lord's Word, please turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, as you're turning, let me just make an announcement that next week we'll be having our Harvest Sunday, and I want you to make plans uh, to attend that. I'll be giving a quiz at the end of the service regarding this piece of information. Next Sunday, we'll be having a potluck meal. That means that the church will provide the meat, the bread, the drinks, but everything else will be uh, from everybody. So just plan like you're having Sunday dinner at your house, and I'm coming over to eat with you, and bring all that food to the church, and then we'll eat it together. How's that? So we want to have a little time, a fellowship. We want you to be a part of that. And I don't know if that's been exactly clear in the, uh, the uh, bulletin there, but I want to make that clear, and we'll hit that again at the end of the service. Today we'll be talking about God's command. God's command. The last couple of weeks we'll be talking about God's instruction. Last week taught God's requirements. Today, God's command. And how 
uh, or what does God command us to do? What is God calling us to do individually? What is He calling us to do collectively as His church as we come together and compose the body of Christ in this, uh, in this place? Um, we've been, uh, we can be involved in a lot of good activities and we can go and go through the motions, but we can ignore the main task in the busyness of life. Have you noticed that? Satan will allow good activities in order to, diva- to, to divert us from doing the main thing that the Lord wants us to do. So I invite you, if you would, just to stand. Let's look at this verse of Scripture. Acts chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 42 and 43. This is Peter speaking there. And he says, He, that is uh, Christ, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he, that is Jesus, is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, for its power. Father, we pray that in these few moments, Father, we would be able to direct our attention completely and absolutely to the truth of your word. And that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts, our minds. Father, help us to focus in on the truth of your word. Father, there are so many things in our hearts and our lives that pull us away from you. But Father, I pray that we would be able to shut those out of our hearts and minds, even now, so that we can focus in on what you're saying. Father, help us to understand, apply it, integrate it to our life as we walk in this life, and that we will be found faithful to you. Thank you again for loving us in Jesus' name. And amen. You can be seated. There's an outline provided there. Please uh, follow along. And I want you to uh, just remember that the Lord commands us to do some things in life. That it's not a suggestion. It is a command of God. I read an article that said that the average church member has sung thousands of hymns, has sung, uh, heard thousands of sermons over their life, but many of them have never led one person to Christ. It appears that the people today in America, that we are better church members than we are Christians. Have you ever thought about that? We're better church members than we are Christians. We know just how to be a church member. We know what's involved, what's required. I mean, at the end of the service, when I ask you what a potluck is, you're going to be able to answer exactly what it is. We know how to be a church member. But being a Christian is not the same thing as being a church member. We are called to put our, our faith in Christ. Of course, we need as a church to worship together. We need to come together, and we need to have fellowship. We're looking forward to next week. We need to have a ministry and take care of one another. But the church also needs to be about the function of evangelism and the function of discipleship. I'm, I'm proud to announce that we had great attendance and participation this past uh, Wednesday night, and we're hoping to have even more this coming Wednesday when we opened our discipleship courses. All five functions of the church are important. Certainly they are. But we need to make sure that all of them are addressed if we want to have that spirit of power and freedom and joy and excitement in the church. If you look in the, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 4, the first words recorded of Jesus are this. Repent. Repent. Because the kingdom of heaven is near. Evangelism. Folks, Everything in our life begins with repentance. You want a freshness in your life? Repent. You say, well, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus. It begins with agreeing with what the Lord is. If you want revival, it begins with repentance. I had a, a young man uh, from years gone by contact me uh, lately. And he had, had gone through some troubles in his life. And I told him, I said, repentance. It starts with repentance in your life. He called me back and and said, you know, I appreciate that. Repentance. You know what? The next words of Jesus have to repent. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men, discipleship. He tells us that we have to follow him. Repent and follow him. Now the question is, what's our part? What is your part in working out to accomplish this command, this mandate? What's our response? First thing is that God commands us to proclaim and to testify Christ. Look there at verse 42. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that, about Christ. Now, don't get hung up on the word preach. You say, well, I'm no preacher. I'm not much of one, as you can tell. We all have to preach. 
What does that word mean? It means to proclaim. It means to testify. It means to announce. It means to communicate. We are commanded to proclaim the good news of Christ, to testify of Christ. And it can be a bit scary. We all have folks in our life that we know are lost without Christ. Some are very intimidating to us to go off and and have a, a, a conversation about the Lord Jesus, about the gospel. Folks, giving a testimony about the Lord's working in your life is not the same thing as sharing the gospel message. You hear me? You can say, well, the Lord's been good to me. That's not sharing the, the gospel. That's not being evangelistic. That's sharing it. That's testifying. It's not proclaiming. People don't know what they don't know. We need to come and communicate the gospel. Repent. Follow me. It's a little bit scary, but you know what? I want to remind you that God can change even our, the scariest enemy into his friend, into his greatest servant. He's working all around us. Even when we're working against him, he's working in our life. It reminds me of the, of the Apostle Paul. I can't think about uh, being changed from an enemy into a servant of God without thinking about the Apostle Paul. You know, remember Saul was zealously persecuting the church. He was zealously persecuting Christians before his Damascus Road experience. He was so focused on what he was wanting to do for God. He was persecuting the church in the name of God. That he realized he didn't realize that he was actually an enemy of God. In fact, his mentor, Gamaliel, was advised to the apostles, as recorded in, in Acts 5. It was about how we should how they should how the Pharisees should deal with the apostles while they were on trial yet again. And he said in verse in chapter 5 of Acts, he says, This is Paul's mentor. He says, I say to you, keep away from these men, that's the apostles, and let them alone. For if this plan of theirs is for if this plan or this is their work of men, it will come to nothing. But it is of God, you can't overthrow it, and you'll be found to fight against God. You see, God's always at work, isn't he? He's always at work. He'll not allow his work to go undone. So oftentimes, I look back through my life and I think, well, I need to be this or I need to be that. It's not about if I'm this or that. It's about being available and working to God. You've heard the greatest uh, 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 ministry is availability. We need to make sure that, I got that wrong, the, be- the greatest ability is availability. We need to make sure that we are available to work for the Lord. He won't let His work go undone, but it's not, it doesn't hinge on us. God seeks a relationship with us, and He wants to change us regardless of our sin. Paul was made in, or Saul was made into the Apostle Paul. Yes, he was the protege of, of uh, Gamaliel. He, he was a, a, a PhD in, in the Jewish law, but he was the same one holding the cloaks at the stoning of Stephen. And then he had his Damascus Road experience, and Paul was sa- or Saul was saved and made into Paul. In fact, if you look in, uh, in Acts 9, uh, Ananias was, was there, and he was talking about how he was a devout man of the law. He had a good testimony. And the Lord came to him and said, Go to this man Saul, for he's my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. So let me ask you a question. How would you like to be Ananias' shoes? How would you like to be the one that was called to go to the persecutor of Christians, to the persecutor of the church? I would be scared to death. You know what? The Lord calls us out, doesn't He? He calls us to a mission. What are the, what are the circumstances or the, the context or the commands uh, of, to proclaim Christ in your life? What are the demands in your personal life for the Lord wants you to call out and proclaim, preach Christ? Testify to Christ. How do you respond to that? I'm sure glad that Ananias responded positively, aren't you? Are you willing to embrace God's will for your life? You say, well, how do I know what God's will is in my life? I tell you, are you listening, first of all? Are you paying attention? Because the Holy, He speaks through His Holy Spirit. He speaks through His Word. He speaks through prayer, through the circumstances of our life. But He wants us to listen to Him. He wants us to engage. You know what? I can set my red Bible on the, on the shelf, and it won't come out and speak to me. 
I have to engage it. I have to read it. And you know what? Even when I read it, it's not enough. I have to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and give me direction, interpret His Word for me, so that I can understand how to live it. It takes a lot of effort. It takes great uh, interaction with the Lord's, word, the Lord's Word. How do we know His Word? By being in it. By being in prayer. The discipline of prayer. And then circumstances. Seeing the Lord work out the circumstances of our life. Where are you? Where are you in your life? I was talking to a student one day and he said, Well, should I continue in this particular school? And I said, where has the Lord put you? <laughs> well, this one may be better. Are you at that other school? Let the Lord work out your life. We're, so, we're such consumers. We want this or that. We're not on a buffet line going down. The Lord wants us to come in and work out our life. He commands us to proclaim and testify Christ. But not only that, His commands are always going to create a crossroads of conviction in us. In words, we're going to come to a road. It divides. It divides here. Look in verse 42, the second part. He commands us to preach Christ, who is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. There's a, there's a crossword of conviction there. God's command is for us to work uh, alongside Him to lead us to a, the, the defining moment in our life. The crossroads of life, it requires faith, it requires action. It's a watershed moment of whether or not we will be obedient or not to God's call in our life. It's that simple. Will I be the man that God's called me to be? Will I follow Him? Will I be uh, obedient to the commands to go and proclaim and testify about Christ? Will I'm living a good life? Folks, that's the social gospel. Well, if I just live a good life, people are going to know that I'm different. There are a lot of nice people out there that are lost without Christ. How will, how will people know that you're not a lost person that's just a nice guy? we got to speak the gospel. we got to verbally give the gospel message. He calls us to be faithful with a little so that He can give us a lot more to do for His glory. But remember, Jesus is the one who appointed by God to what? Be the judge of the living and the dead. He's going to judge. We will be judged by Christ himself for our faithfulness and our devotion to him. You know what? I met Jane in a bowling class in, in college. I was terrible at bowling, still am terrible at bowling. And it wasn't about participation back then. It was about the score. The grade was about the score. <laughs> I can't even, I can't even, uh, I don't even know how to keep score in bowling. It's pretty complex. I was terrible at it. Thank the Lord that he doesn't rate my ability as, and judge me on my ability. In fact, he, he gives me the ability. He rates me on my, uh, on my uh, faithfulness, my willingness. God's grace is what, what, what uh, he, our, our ability is based on his grace. What is God? How has God called you to proclaim Christ? Did you understand what I said? How has He called you? Now, when we first got married, before we went to seminary, we had a little time before school started, and I took a job at Sears selling suits. And it was a little commission job. And the guy said, when somebody walks up to you, you don't ask them, can I help you? You ask them what? How can I help you? Because the context is, you're selling suits, and when someone walks up to you, they're not going to, you're not there to say, can I help you? Because, of course, they're, they want some help. They're wanting to buy a suit at Sears. You ask, how can I help? How has God called you to proclaim and testify of Christ? How has He called you? Because you are called. You are called to proclaim the name of Christ verbally with your life. To testify of Christ. How has he done that? What people does he want you to do? To go reach? How can you uh, be obedient? How, what adjustments does he want you to make in your life to uh, fo follow the commands of God? What are those things in your life that you have to do? That's the question that we have. You see, we've been called to a crossroads of conviction. Will you be obedient or not? It's, when we look back at the Apostle Paul, it was a, a huge task that he was called to do. 
He couldn't rely on his own ability. His ability was out uh, in the law trying to, to uh, cut back and forth about the law, the black and white of the law. He had a, a great opportunity there, but it was a great change in his life. And a nice too. But Paul was speaking about knowing Christ in Philippians 3. He said that my goal was to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of what? His sufferings and being conformed in His death. Now that's a departure from persecuting the church, folks. It reminds me of Hebrews 12, where uh, speaking of the Lord, he says, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the upcoming joy, he endured the cross. For the joy of coming back and being with the Father, he endured the cross. Are you growing in, no, in your knowing the Lord Jesus? Are you growing in your knowledge of God by your experiencing and obeying Him and, and what He is accomplishing in your life, of the, the work that you're doing, the service that you're giving to Christ? The secret of, of Paul's success is the same secret to our success, his abiding, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit through Christ. Amen? You know, he was even witnessing the King Agrippa you look a few chapters down in Acts 26, Paul was talking to King Agrippa, and he said, I wasn't disobedient to the vision from heaven. Talking about that Damascus Road experience. He said he was called first to Damascus, then to Jerusalem and Judea, the Gentiles, and I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Did you get that last part? That they should repent and what? Prove their repentance by their deeds. He was obedient. He wanted to know Christ. He wanted to know the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of the resurrection, conform to his death, and preach the gospel. God chooses us to serve him. He chooses to serve him uh, so that we can reconcile this lost world to himself. He wants to be us to be a part of that. Can you imagine anything in the world that's more important than being able to be used by God in that uh, facilitation? Paul said in Acts 22 that he will be a witness, to, that God called him to be a witness to all men for what he had seen and heard. And he was talking about the Damascus Road experience. Our command is no different. You say, well, I've not seen Christ come and tell me anything, but you have the Holy Spirit of God in your life. When the Lord Jesus came in and saved your soul, He gave you the, the Holy Spirit to comfort you, to equip you, to do the work in you. And He commands you to be obedient. He commands you to proclaim, to preach, and to testify. In Damascus, Paul was told of all he had been assigned to do. He was, Paul had been allowed to know God's will and to, to hear uh, what Christ was speaking to him. And Paul was to be the Lord's witness to all people. And the Lord told Paul that he was sending him far away to the Gentiles and also to his own people. And Paul fully knew that God's, what God's promised is him was the very demanding and it required what? Obedience on his part. Faithfulness. On his part. So he went from being the enemy of God to being the servant of God. You're going to face a crossroads of conviction. When you engage or you consider proclaiming the name of Christ, testifying of the gospel of Christ, it comes to a crossroads, a watershed moment. Will you allow this? Uh, uh, challenges in your life to stop you from proclaiming and testifying about Christ. It's that simple. Will I allow it to stop me? What will stop me? Because God commands us to proclaim and to testify. And it's going to come down to a crossroads of conviction. But folks, the Holy Spirit equips you to complete God's commands. He equips you. You are empowered. You say, well, I can't do it. You're exactly right. You can't do it. The Holy Spirit comes in and gives you the direction. In Acts 10, the Holy Spirit came down on those who heard the message. And they circumcised 
Uh, the circumcised believers, that's the Jews, who had come to Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentiles. For they heard him speaking in tongues and declaring what? The greatness of God. All people, all people. The Holy Spirit has been preparing you from the first day you accepted Christ as your Savior. Did you know that? He's preparing you. He's preparing you to be an effective witness in His kingdom. He's preparing you to be effective in the everyday life of going here and there, but in verbally communicating the gospel. And I know that we have trials and challenges, we endure sufferings, but these will toughen us spiritually so that we will persevere under great difficulties. Look around this world today. Look around this country today. How did it get like this? And many times we want to say, what in the world's going on around here? Lean back against the fence as if we had no responsibility in any of it. Folks, we're here today, alive in America. Amen. You think they're going to judge somebody else? The Lord's going to, He's the judge of the living of the dead. He's been appointed by God. We can't just sit back and watch Fox News and say, this is a terrible place we're in. Get active. Get out there. Be a part of the solution. Paul grew up attending Jewish schools and studying the law and the prophets. He was credentialed to teach in any synagogue. He spent three years in Arabia having his heart and mind reformed by God after he had given his life to Christ. He served the Lord in Galatia for ten years. Barnabas was the only one that would come and disciple him for a year because they were all scared to death of him. Barnabas came and encouraged him and discipled him for a year as they taught in the church at Antioch. Folks, I want you to hear me say that God sends you to a place where he can work, find his best work in you and he wants to accomplish uh, his commands through your life. But it's going to take a lot for us to do that. From the, from the beginning of Paul's relationship with the risen Christ, he knew. He knew that he was being sent to the unreached, to the outcasts of this world. Who's God sent you to see? Who is God sending you to proclaim the good news of Christ? Who is He wanting you to, to speak the gospel? But they not receive it. They may push it back on me. Let them. Let them. The Lord has told us that we have a command to proclaim and testify of Christ. And we have to be ready and we are equipped to God. When I was teaching in the seminary, I used to ask the students, one day, you're going to be ministering to people. What do you need to learn today? Today, that they need to know later in life. Oftentimes, we go through discipleship. And we think, well, it's about me. It's about so I can grow. How I can get through life's hurdles. Folks, that's part of it. But it's so that you can be recharged and equipped so that you can go off and, 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 and educate and disciple and minister to others as well. Share the gospel with others as well. It's never been about you or me. It's about the Lord Jesus. It's not about me being scared or uncomfortable or a little weak in the knees or even not having good ability. It's about being faithful to the Lord with what He's called us to do. What happens... If we don't complete God's commands to proclaim and testify Christ, what happens? Well, God won't let His work go undone, first of all. But we'll miss the blessing. But you know what? A lot of, a lot of folks won't do it because there's a great cost. There's a great cost, isn't there? I mean, he told, Christ uh, told uh, Ananias in Acts 9, he, he was talking about uh, you know, go and, and tell uh, Paul that he's my chosen instrument. And he says, I will show Paul or Saul how much he will suffer for my name. How much he will suffer for my name. That was the second sentence out of the Lord's mouth. Is his instructions to Ananias. Go, he's my chosen one. To take my name to the Gentiles, the kings, and the Israelites. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There's a cost. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, five times 
I received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. I received stonings. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent out on the open sea. I I faced danger from rivers and robbers, from my own people, from Gentiles, in the city, in the wilderness, at the sea. I faced dangers from false brothers, toil and hardship and sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, cold, without clothing, and the daily pressures and the concern for the churches. He did. He suffered a lot for Christ. In fact, he he told us in Galatians, I bear the marks of Christ on my body. I was reading Hebrews this week, and it just stands in stark contrast to that statement. He says, you have not yet stood, you have not yet withstood to bloodshed. And that's true. We have not withstood to bloodshed. We get our feelings hurt a little bit. People point fingers at us and laugh once in a while. But we haven't withstood to bloodshed. But many of our brothers and sisters around the world are enduring that, even as we speak today. But even in all that context, all the cost of being a disciple of Christ, Paul says in Romans 8, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of the glory that is going to be revealed to us. It's not even comparable of what's waiting for us in heaven. Will you complete the command of God? Will you complete the command of God? You see, God will do His work with or without you. He's going to complete it one way or another. He's going to bring people from every nation to worship Him and glorify Him. But we're privileged, folks. We are so privileged to be chosen, to be called, to be promised, to be prepared and sent and guided and even commanded to bring these people to glorify Christ for now and for all eternity. That's what God's put in our hearts and our lives. He commands us to proclaim and testify. And yeah, it costs us. It's a crossroad of conviction, but the Holy Spirit's going to equip us. He's going to equip us to do the work. Let me just read you one last verse, and I'm done. Very familiar verse, Matthew 28. Jesus came near to them, and he said what? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Pause. How much authority has been given to Christ? A little bit? All. All authority. And then he tells us, From that authority, He commissions us. Go, make disciples of all the nations. That's not discipleship, that's evangelism because you're making disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And here's the discipleship part. Teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. We've been given an assignment. Verse 19, go. You've been given an assignment. Go. We've been given the authority by way of the commission. We've been commissioned by Christ's authority in verse 18. And we've been given the assurance that He is with us always to the end of the age. Remember, don't forget. By the way, it wasn't a by the way. It was don't forget this. I know it's scary. There's going to be a cost. Go. Go. You know, there's been an occasion that I have asked my sons to do things that I knew would cause them great difficulty in life. Challenge, heartbreak even. Do they'd be scared. And I let them do it anyway. Because you know what? I think that's how we make men, don't you? <laughs> I think that's, that's the real world out there. We weren't trying to get them in a little... Uh, have a little party for the rest of their life. No one's going to jump up and down for them the rest of their life. they got to be men. You know, we had that conversation a lot when we were growing, when they were growing up, Jan and I. We were making godly men, and that was our little motto that we often lived by. And the world wasn't going to throw them a party. One day they won't get married, have kids, have a mortgage, a job. Boss, it was unfair to them, all the stuff that goes on with life. The Lord sends us out knowing that there's danger. He sends us out knowing that there's difficulty. But He sends us. He sends us and He tells us, we're not going alone. We're not going alone. We've been given assignment. Proclaim and testify. We've been given authority, even though it causes us some crossroads, a a little doubt sometimes. And we've been given the assurance that the Holy Spirit is going to equip us and that Jesus would never leave us or forsake us. 
question is, what's our response to God's commands? What is your response to what the Lord wants to do in your life? Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for your word, the power that it contains. And Father, I pray that as we come to this time of decision, this time of commitment or recommitment, that we would be obedient to you. Father, that we would find uh, ourselves in your will. And Father, if we're not in your will, Father, that we would uh, make whatever adjustments that we have to be to be obedient to you. So Father, I thank you for your love and your mercy. I pray for each person here as we uh, examine our own hearts and lives in uh, contrast to your will. And we thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. And amen. Well, amen. Thank you all for being here today. Let me ask you a question. On next Sunday, are we having a potluck meal? Say yes or no. And does that mean that we're providing all the food or do y'all have to bring some food? Y'all bring food. That was a true or false. <laughs> you see, I was a terrible test giver. I was... I'm never really good at giving tests. All right, so you all know to bring the food. Let me just go run through some announcements, if I may. Don't forget about our Wednesday night discipleship. We're having a great time of fellowship and Bible study. And if you're not being a part of that, uh, you're missing a blessing. And you know what? You're robbing others of a blessing of the Lord speaking through your life. I know it's a hard uh, struggle sometimes to get over here. I know you're working and so forth. But please, make the effort. You'll be blessed, and you will be a blessing to others as well. Um, there are many uh, studies there that are mentioned in the, the bulletin. Um, I was told that the one after the boxes are unpacked um, is still open. It's for women who are new in town, and uh, they want you to be a part of that. So please, you come. Paige and Jane are teaching that one. Also, uh, Ronnie's teaching, We Will Not Be Silenced. Uh, Ronnie Neese, that's a great one. I'm re uh, Dad, my dad, Charles, is. I keep calling him dad like y'all know who he is, but y'all do know who he is. Experiencing grief, uh, it's in the fellowship hall, and then I'm doing one called Forward as we go forward in our uh, life with Christ. So I want you to be a, a part of those as well. Also, um, and I assume you're here for Trunk or Treat, so I'll, I'll leave that one for a moment. Next Sunday is Harvest Sunday, and I know we're having a potluck, and that's fantastic. We need to have fellowship. But at 10 o'clock, we're going to be in this room, and uh, we have some ladies who are coming down from Michigan to sing for us, and so they're going to be making a great effort to come and lead us in worship. I want you to be a part of that, and I want you to bring everybody you know and, uh, and bring them in here. It'll be a great time of fellowship and singing. We're also going to have a baby dedication. Did you know that? And so we're going to have some ladies, or some uh, some young men that will be dedicated to the Lord that will be up here as well. We want you uh, to come and support those families. And then also we'll have a worship service, and that will be wonderful as well. And uh, we want you to come and, and just enjoy that day. We'll start at 10. We'll go through a, a time of, uh, of, of singing and so forth. We'll have an intermission, and then we'll come back in and have our worship service. I can't guarantee that it's going to hit at 11 o'clock. I can guarantee that it's going to be sometime. And so uh, you come and start at 10, and then, and then we'll just keep on going until we uh, wind up having a little bite to eat. Also, we have a, the following Sunday on November the 12th. I know you can read this, but I want to just tell you we're going to be having a tailgate Sunday school. It's just a time of fellowship. We'll have it outside, weather permitting. If we can't, we'll do it in the fellowship hall. It'll be time for, uh, for uh, just a time of breakfast. Nick is going to be teaching Sunday. Where are you, Nick? You up there? Nick's going to be teaching Sunday school that day for the whole group. So we want to come out and support Nick. And I've heard great things about Nick's teaching. And so I'm looking forward to hearing him teach. And so we're going to be a part of that as well. So you make sure you do that. You need to sign up uh, in, in your Sunday school uh, class. And you can uh, make, a, make sure you're doing that. Make sure I get all these done. Oh, also, um, we need someone to sign up for the nursery. So y'all need to sign up for the nursery, and you can, uh, what can they sign up? You can put, what can they sign up for the nursery? Karen. Karen, just tell Karen. Yeah, see Karen for the whole everything, and she can tell you what's going on more than I can anyway. All right, come up here and tell us about um, our trunk or treat, and after that, you just, we're going to let Mike come up here and, and pray for us. Y'all have a great rest of the day. I'll be quick. I just wanted to remind everybody, Tuesday night is Trunk or Treat. Uh, last year we had over 500 people on this hill. So please, we need each and every one of you. It says it starts at 6. Get here as early as you can. Uh, 
If you can be here at 530, it would be great because at 545, there's a line out here always ready to go. So please come because we need everybody. Candy is the reason to come, but we also share the gospel with the people. We have uh, tracks we put in each kid's bag and uh, Bibles that we can give the older kids. So uh, please come and help us with it. Uh, we're going to have a photo booth. You can take a picture of yourself if you'd like to have one. Uh, so we're going to have that this year, which is a little addition. Uh, be some food and candy. And we need each and every one of you. But come and, and help us with this. It's a great, great outreach. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. I just want to echo one thing. I know you're standing up and you're ready to go home, but let me just say this. This isn't about candy. I mean, I, I'm glad that we get to give some people some candy and get to see some kids ripped up like Batman. That's fun. But we're here to share the gospel, amen? And we're going to be able to do that. So you, uh, you come not only to, to be here, but you come ready to share the gospel and, uh, and follow up with these folks as we uh, have time after, after the event as well. We appreciate your participation. We always have a great time doing that. Mike, you come and press out of here.